Hello and a warm welcome to another edition of To The Point. On the show this week, Director General, Indian Council of Medical Research, Soumya Swaminathan. Welcome on To The Point. My first question to you is uh, related to the Gorakhpur tragedy which uh, happened recently. Uh, there is a confusion as to what exactly happened. 70 deaths happening at such a frequency. What actually went wrong? So I think we have to look at the Gorakhpur uh, episode that you know, has been covered extensively in the media uh, from a longer perspective. And if you really look at what's been happening there, for many, many years now, every year during the rainy season, there is an outbreak of an acute encephalitis type of syndrome. So when we say syndrome, we generally mean that uh, it's not due to one particular cause or etiology. It's uh, something that could be caused by a number of different uh, possibilities. But young children, you know, first getting fever, then getting sick with convulsions, with uh, then going into unconsciousness and many of them end up dying. So this is a constant, uh, I mean, this has been an annual feature for many, many years. And the earlier investigations had shown that uh, it's a disease called Japanese encephalitis, which is a virus that's spread through mosquitoes. And uh, at that time in 2006, the government started a vaccination program. So there was a mass vaccination program. This was repeated again a couple of years later. And from 2011 or so, there's been a regular vaccine. The Japanese encephalitis vaccine is now given to all children. Uh, at two, there are two injections given, one at six months and one at... So with the regular immunization which is happening, have the figures really come down? Yes. So the strange thing is that... Japanese encephalitis has come down as the vaccination coverage has improved mm -hmm. and today we're seeing a vaccination coverage of about 50% uh, of children getting two shots and about 70% getting at least one shot. The proportion of these AES cases, encephalitis cases, which are due to Japanese encephalitis is now less than 10%, it's 7 8%. Okay. However, the number of cases of encephalopathy and encephalitis has not really reduced and neither has the number of deaths. So this is the mystery that what are the remaining uh, causes or what are the infections that are causing this. And our research over the last few years has shown that there's an infection called scrub typhus. Mm -hmm. It's a bacterial infection which um, spreads through uh, mites okay. that live on rats and other animals and that are also found, you know, in the, in the scrub. It's called scrub typhus because it's found these mites are there in the bushes and they possibly are biting these children and so about 30 to 40 percent or even up to 60 percent in the BRD Medical College of the children who are coming in with this type of uh, syndrome are now uh, you know positive for this scrub typhus infection. So this scrub typhus infection which you're talking about is it restricted only to the Gorakhpur belt and the surrounding areas or is it spreading elsewhere in the country? It's actually a very widespread infection okay. and uh, so it's not restricted to that area. There are reports from all over the country, Uttarakhand, uh, Tamil Nadu, you know, Assam, Karnataka, Orissa. So it's, it's quite widely prevalent. But what is uh, peculiar here, I think, is that the scrub typhus infection is resulting in these fairly large numbers of children who are developing a, a neurological problem. Okay. That's not commonly seen in the rest of the country. And so we need to really understand are there other factors, other risk factors or other things happening there which are aggravating the neurological problems of scrub typhus. But talking specifically about Japanese encephalitis, uh, why is it really a mystery when it comes to the research on Japanese encephalitis? Because recently uh, there was an announcement on a research facility which is going to be soon started in uh, Gorakhpur. Uh, don't you see this as as coming uh, too late but very little or it could have been done much earlier how how would you really see it no you are absolutely right i think that a lot more comprehensive research needs to go into gorakhpur is one area where we have this sort of a hotbed of all kinds of infections going on there are other parts of the country as well with uh, very severe health problems and so this, uh, the research unit that was set up in Gorakhpur a few years ago by the ICMR was essentially focused on just this one thing, you know, these children who are coming in and dying of so-called encephalitis. And over the years, the research has thrown a lot of light onto the possible causes 
and how it could be prevented. In fact, last year we, we uh, really had a lot of preparatory activity with the state government on developing clinical algorithms, how can doctors in primary health centers diagnose and treat scrub typhus so that they can prevent children from actually developing the neurological illness and, uh, and also other preventive and education measures. So that's focusing on this problem. But I think Eastern Uttar Pradesh, if you look at the health indicators, there's uh, a lot of improve, scope for improvement, whether it's maternal and infant mortality, whether it's infectious diseases or, you know, uh, undernutrition. I think this is the background, poor health indicators on which anything which comes, you know, then is likely to blow up into a, into a crisis because of the, also the lack of health facilities. If you look at BRD Medical College, it's catering to such a huge population, seven districts, you know, of Eastern Uttar Pradesh, also Bihar and, and from Nepal. And uh, however, you know, much hard they try, the doctors and nurses in the pediatric ward, it's impossible to provide quality care to hundreds of sick children. But uh, when you talk specifically about what happened in Gorapur, another side of the story is that apparently the oxygen supply was uh, cut off. Let's not go into the merits of exactly what happened because the inquiry is still on. But what I would like to understand from you is that when it comes to the procurement part, payment to the vendors, payment for the devices, the consumables, uh, why is it such a messy affair? Not talking only about Uttar Pradesh, but across the country, if you see, it, it doesn't look like a very transparent process. Uh, government agencies are accused of, uh, uh, of being bad paymasters and corrupt practices generally come to the limelight. Uh, how can you really eradicate uh, this perception? Yeah, I think you've touched on a very important issue and it's, it's true that periodically one comes across instances of uh, you know a supply chain breakdown whether it's a diagnostic kit or a vaccine or a drug and so on but you know it doesn't have to be like that i mean there are states in india which have worked out and implemented a really good procurement system for medical supplies and uh, take the example of tamil nadu rajasthan you know there are many kind of states that have done it where the system works so beautifully that at any point of time, you know exactly how much you have stocks. There are central stocks, there are district level stocks, and then there's an inventory so that, you know, the supply, and there's a centralized procurement, transparent bidding, transparent tender process. Corruption comes down, the prices at which you're buying, you know, come down dramatically, and the supplies are maintained. So I think that, you know, all states really should move to this kind of system. There's no need to do kind of ad hoc procurement, which le leaves a lot of scope for, you know, not only malpractices, but also situations like this, where you're suddenly out of a life-saving uh, drug. Uh, taking you away from Gorakhpur now and coming to the larger issues uh, which are ailing the health sector, let's begin with uh, talking about the general uh, medical research which is happening. and in your institute as well. There are about uh, 600 scientists who are working across some 32 institutes. But uh, when it comes to uh, the, the major interventions, have they been really done? Because there is a perception and there, there have been reports which say that ICMR has not been making the right interventions when it comes to the patents, uh, diagnostic tests, or some kind of a major intervention. That actually has not been taking place. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, uh, I'm glad you brought this up because, you know, there's this perception that medical research or science in this country has not delivered uh, with, uh, with uh, exceptions of, you know, space, achieve the achievements that we've had in space or atomic energy. I mean, those are visible to everyone. But after all, those are also done by Indian scientists. Now, in the area of, uh, of uh, you know, biomedical research, it requires... Uh, it's, a, it's always a team effort in the sense that different groups have to do different parts, work on different parts of the problem in order to put the puzzle together. So whether it's developing a new drug or a vaccine, everything from, you know, the field studies on the epidemiology of the disease to some scientist working in a lab who's, who's actually got the idea for a new vaccine candidate, a, a company that comes forward to take that up for further development, then it has to go into animal and then into human studies till it eventually gets marketed. Now, it is true that in India we have not had 
uh, a huge number of new drugs uh, or vaccines being developed indigenously, though we've been very good at doing generic manufacturing and really reducing the, uh, the cost of... So if you look at vaccines, two-thirds of the vaccines in the world are made in India and, and similarly for drugs. But there have been notable successes and I, I, I would name one or two of them, the rotavirus vaccine, for example, that was again worked on by a number of different agencies. ICMR was a silent partner there, you know, doing the surveillance, the epidemiology and helping in the testing. You take a drug like miltefusine for Kala Azar, right. that ICMR had a big role in the development of that drug. So the investment that ICMR makes into neglected tropical diseases is significant globally. Right. It's, it's more than many other uh, research agencies do. Polio, let's take elimination of polio has been a huge success story for India. Again, ICMR has played a very important role in the monitoring, the surveillance, the environmental sample testing, making sure that the polio virus found, is it a wild polio or is it a vaccine derived polio? So these kind of things generally remain under the radar. But these, these are the notable examples which you have uh, spoken of. But if you really talk about the research outcomes, uh, they generally don't commensurate with, with the magnitude and the, and the disease burden which is seen in the country. So how would you really ease this burden or how can you really make the task easier? Yes, I think that there are many things that need to be done. I agree with you that we need, we need to do much more that our health challenges are so huge that medical research, health research really needs to step up to a different level. If we just compare ourselves with the National Institutes of Health in the US, which is the premier you know, biomedical research agency in the country, their budget, their annual budget is $30 billion. The annual budget of ICMR is about $200 million. So, so there's a huge difference there in the resources that are available. But it's not only, only the resources. It's the environment in which scientists can work and operate the freedoms and flexibilities that are allowed to bind people down with a lot of rules and regulations. But when you say freedom and flexibilities, uh, what do you actually hint at? I mean, are, are the scientists not getting an enabling environment to further their research? They're not being encouraged? What, what does it hint to? You know, it varies a lot. Uh, there are institutes, but in general, if you look at institutes that are run by government and institutes that are run by others, you know, not-for-profits right. or uh, uh, completely autonomous bodies, you see a huge difference mm -hmm. in, the, in the environment. Um, so I think we can do a lot more within our own government uh, institutions also to, to change the culture of research. And part of it is we have to be nimble, we have to be fast moving in the area of research. We cannot, uh, you know, adopt bureaucratic procedures that delay because science moves very fast. Right. I think global partnerships are important and that's now happening. In the past, we've been a little wary of partnering because we think, you know, somebody's going to steal our ideas and so on. We've always been very possessive about our own. But in today's world, that's, that doesn't help. You know, people have uh, collaborate across globally now because you can just pick up a phone, you can get on WhatsApp. You know, it's so fast and we need the strengths that are present in different labs around the world to be able to advance our ideas quickly. So even Gorakhpur, for example, now we're going to collaborate with a group of scientists at Columbia University who've got the latest techniques where they can look for bacteria and viruses in samples where, you know, we haven't found anything. So a quick action there, you know, could lead to something which could save a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. So I think global partnerships are important. Freedom, flexibility and, uh, and breaking silos, breaking silos. And I think that's again slowly happening mm -hmm. because a lot of things are duplicated unnecessarily, a lot of things are, knowledge is there but it's not being shared and disseminated. And one I think big uh, area we need to improve is science communication. A lot of the perceptions about scientists in India, oh kuch nahi hota hai, you know, all this money goes into a dump and nothing ever comes out is because we're not communicating. We're not telling people what we've done to change uh, lives. You made a very important point and uh, uh, many times, uh, Soumya, what happens is that uh, maybe some policy interventions are not made or because of uh, the lack of political will many times, uh, there, there is, you know, there is a perception which is formed in the minds of, of the common 
person that maybe the scientist community in India has become very complacent, they don't want to move ahead. That is the kind of impression they, they do uh, give sometimes. Yeah, so I think again, you know, there's, a, there's no common space uh, to talk about. So I think now there are, there are several initiatives, especially among the younger scientists who have begun to, to reach out. But I think we have to do a lot more. And I, I hope that also that more journalists would start Right. There are a few very good journalists now that you know, focus on all the advances that are happening in different labs in the country. That needs to happen. Uh, you know, just if you look at the life expectancy in India when we got independence and what it is today, it's doubled. It was about in 35. Today, our life expectancy is 70. Right. Now, that couldn't have happened without advances in health care and, and because of health research. So one doesn't see day to day, you know, very visible things coming out. Ki, there's a new drug today. There's a new vaccine. But if you take the longer view, then you can see what science has contributed to, to development as a whole in India. But uh, if you talk about the report uh, the, of uh, the Parliamentary uh, Standing Committee on Health, uh, they very clearly said, and I'm going to quote, that there is a huge persistent and recurring mismatch between the projected demands for funds and the actual allocation of the schemes and the projects of the Department of Health Research. How can this gap really be bridged? according to you? I mean, I think the only way it can be bridged is by the government, uh, uh, you know, putting in more support for research. And I'm talking specifically about health research. Okay. You know, we've got uh, huge uh, health uh, problems, as you mentioned. We have a rising burden of non-communicable diseases, of cancer, of mental health. All these are going to pull people down in their productive years of life. And if we don't address them today, tomorrow we're going to spend 10 times the amount on treating all these people with chronic disease. Mm -hmm. So I think investing in research on prevention, on management, whether it's you know, preventing diabetics from progressing to chronic kidney disease, or whether it's finding better ways to treat cancer, or uh, you know, new drugs and vaccines for infectious diseases. I think our scale of uh, support and investment for research has to go up you know, three, four, five times what it is today. But when you have to go forward on a particular research, uh, uh, relevant data is a very important component for any research. Yes. And uh, I have heard many scientists say that uh, there's a complete lack of relevant data. We, we don't know on which data to rely on. Uh, how far is that true? Yes, so there's, there's a lot of data. Part of the problem is finding the right data source and knowing what to believe. So I think ICMR is taking a very strong uh, lead on this. I do believe that we need to bring all health data into one large warehouse repository and also we need to play a role in generating data. So we've, for example, for many years run the cancer registry in India. The cancer registry now provides the only source of data we have on national cancer figures. Similarly, we've recently done the INDIAB study, National Survey of Diabetes and Hypertension. We're now uh, uh, working with the National Family Health Survey to see if we can embed a national survey on nutrition and metabolics. So I think regular data collection as part of surveillance is important. One other area where we do poorly is data on the causes of death. Most developed countries have what they call a vital registration system where the cause of death is recorded clearly. So just by looking at that record, you know what the burden of disease is. What are your citizens dying of at any point of time and how are the trends changing. So in India, we're, you know, we're looking at that. Till then, we have to do modeling and estimation to find out what the burden of disease is. But, but ultimately, times, we when, when, you have, when you're talking about the disease burden and the, the number of cases arising out yeah. of a particular disease, many times, I mean, irrespective of which government have, has been in power, we have seen that because of the political uh, compulsions and political interventions, many times, you know, there is an effort to hide that data. Uh, does that become an impediment also? Yes, I think the first step really is to acknowledge our problem and to accept that. And that usually doesn't happen. And unless that happens, we can't begin to address it. So I think we need to, we need to learn to really acknowledge the problem that's coming out of scientific evidence and then say, okay, now how do we go about addressing that? And I think ICMR's role is to bring that, that scientific evidence forward. Talking specifically about India, where the health over the years has been low on priority and looking at the budgetary allocations also of the current year, you've seen that uh, so far it has just been 1% uh, 
of the GDP. Now with the national health policy 2017 coming up, they have aimed to uh, raise the figure to about 2.5. But in a country where you are having about 26 million births every year and the aim is up to reach that level up to 2025, uh, do you think would that be enough? Well, it will certainly be a step in the right direction. So I think, as you said, the national health policy very clearly spells out. I think we have to focus on several things at the same time. We have to focus, of course, on infrastructure and improving the availability of diagnostics and drugs at the primary health centers. Human resources are extremely important. So I think government moved towards training nurse practitioners and utilizing Ayush doctors to provide care. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's going to be extremely important. More specialists. We need more gynecologists, pediatricians, surgeons. You know, the complete lack of surgical facilities available at our uh, district or sub-district level. So that needs to be strengthened. And finally, governance. The governance, even if there's private-public partnership in running some of these uh, centers, I think the governance has to be very strong and that has to always remain with government. But you, you pointed out a, a very significant point about the shortage of manpower in the medical uh, field. Now, there are figures which have just come in that there are about 47,000 Indian doctors who are practicing in U.S. and about 25,000 practicing in U.K., which makes India the largest exporter of doctors in the world. So, is the government doing anything to arrest this trend? Because you need doctors at home and so many doctors are being drained out to other countries. Well, I think uh, there, there have been some moves to actually limit the number of uh, you know, permissions that are given to people to, to go outside. But, but I think the, the issue is really that uh, we have to look at also other healthcare providers. Uh, if you expect a doctor after having gone through a lot of training you know, to really go and sit in a remote rural or tribal area where doing basically primary health care, then there may be a few doctors, yes, who are motivated to do that. But majority of times you will not find. So I think that this approach of having nurse practitioners, it's, it's been found to work in Africa quite well. Okay. Um, and middle level people who've done three, four years of training and who can do primary health care, know when to refer and what to refer. And then having the specialists and others at the district level, you know, that will help to resolve. But I think, you know, a lot of our Indian doctors abroad are probably quite willing to help in some way or the other and we can we can reach out to them, but um, but the doctors do we do have in India are also very uh, uh, disproportionately you know distributed. Majority 80% are in urban areas and only 20% are in are in rural areas where 70% of our population lives. So that's the mismatch that we have to we have to find ways of bridging through task shifting and through using now technology. The, I think by using technology we can do a lot of specialist care at primary health center level without the doctor or the specialist being physically present there. So we have to think of these kind of ways of delivering care. But uh, you, you spoke about the components within the health sector, but when it comes to the patients, uh, we have seen that India is one of those countries, when you look at the BRIC economies, that this is one country where patients are having the largest out-of-pocket uh, expenditure on health. Uh, is that not a worrying trend and it is leading to some kind of, a, of a asymmetry in the society? At your level, do you think you will be able to do something? So you are right that the out-of-pocket expenditure in India is very high, you know, and uh, it pushes a lot of people into poverty. So certainly there's something needs to be done and you know the National Health Assurance Plan which aims to first cover the very poor 8 crore families with a health insurance package and many states have already implemented this kind of a health insurance package. I think that can go to some extent. Ultimately we do need to move to a system of universal health insurance so that nobody has to spend out of pocket. And again providing, I think India can really take the lead in providing cost effective and cost efficient sustainable uh, health care at rates that don't have to be unaffordable. But do you think India has made a beginning anywhere towards that direction yes. where you have a universal health care? Because looking at the current setup, there is still a very deep divide between uh, the, the, the way the government agencies are treating the patients and the private sector, the way they are treating uh, financially and also uh, if you talk about the other frameworks, there is a huge difference. There is also a difference in perception because there are some of the best doctors work in government hospitals because they have so much experience of uh, seeing patients and so on. So 
and there are government run hospitals which are providing you know world class care in india so i think we need to really have that standard and try and bring all our hospitals to that standard and uh, i think with more of quality assurance programs and you know ensuring that these basic standards are met and uh, again it's a question of governance and how strictly we implement some of the quality standards that we have in place like nabh for example there are very few government hospitals you know that might be nabh accredited whereas many more private hospitals because they want that stamp when you say that uh, if policies are there on paper implementation is not happening very strictly and that becomes a major impediment uh, in in the smooth roll out of uh, the schemes and the things but if you talk to the politicians or if you talk to the political fraternity they will say that health is a state subject and uh, it's up to the state government how they implement so it's it, it becomes a a passing of a buck kind of a game and with no one really accountable but at the central level can there be a standard benchmark on which the things can be judged without of course blaming the state government or the central government can there be a standardized operating procedure to see that things uh, look smooth and look even in the health sector yes i think certainly that's the role of the center and they have been doing that with you know the policies uh, but also with uh, coming out with very specific uh, guidelines for implementation of certain specific programs like maternal and child health or tuberculosis or the vector borne disease control program okay. and uh, recently the niti aayog has come out with a system where they are going to be able to grade states okay. based on certain important health indicators so this is i think a good way mm -hmm. of uh, states both to see where they uh, where they are and also to try and get better and and i think payments are also ultimately going to be linked to that kind of the improvement so that will be an incentive for states to do better but i think again you know being very uh, in india we have the extremes we have infant mortality rates which are as good as western europe you know the single digit so kerala goa uh, tamil nadu and you know now many other states are coming down to that level and then you also have infant mortality you know in the 50s and 60s so within the same country we have this huge heterogeneity so if we can do it in one part of india surely we can do it others. yes in other parts so i think it's we have to learn uh, states can learn from each other they don't have to reinvent the wheel and what's worked in one state could just be picked up and implemented in another so we need to hope that that the states who haven't done that well so far will now put health as top priority and and start working on it it was a pleasure talking to you uh, somya So that's it on this episode of To the Point. See you next time with another personality. Goodbye and thanks for watching.